Part 1 Christopher Sly becomes a lord. The tavern door opened suddenly and a man was pushed out into the road. He was very drunk and very angry. He fell onto the ground. Then he picked himself up and shook the dust from his clothes. He turned round and glared. You can't treat me like this! He shouted to the landlady of the tavern. How dare you throw me into the street! The landlady stood on the steps of the tavern and looked down on the man. She too was angry and her face was red. Will you pay for the glasses you've broken? She demanded. Never! Cried the man. My name is Sly and my family is an old one. We are not the kind of people you can treat without respect. The landlady looked at him with disgust. She knew that Christopher Sly was not an important man at all. She could tell by the clothes he was wearing and by the way he spoke and behaved. Very well, she told him. I'm going to call a constable. He'll make you pay for those broken glasses. The landlady went back inside the tavern and slammed the door shut. A constable! You send for anyone you like. Christopher Sly shouted at the closed door. Now, what do I care? I'm staying here. I won't move until he comes. Christopher Sly sat down on the ground. He was tired now and his head was beginning to hurt. He had drunk a lot of beer and he wanted to rest. He rolled over and went to sleep under a bush. In a few minutes, he was fast asleep and snoring loudly. Soon there was the sound of horses in the road. Someone blew a horn. It was a hunting party returning from the field. The lord of the hunting party was talking to his servants. He loved hunting and he was fond of his hounds. Did you see how well Silver did today? He asked one of his men. That dog is a marvel. I wouldn't sell him for 20 pounds. Bellman's a good dog too, my lord. The man replied. He did well in the field today too. I think he's better than Silver. You're a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. The lord said coldly. Now, take all the hounds and give them some food. I want to hunt again tomorrow. Look after them well, do you hear me? The Lord looked down at the ground and caught sight of Christopher Sly lying there. Sly was still sleeping soundly. The Lord was disgusted. He hated drunkenness. Look at that fellow, he said to one of his servants. What a filthy animal he is. Then he had an idea. He began to smile. He spoke to the servant again. What do you think that fellow would imagine, he asked, if he found himself in a comfortable bed when he wakes, with jewels on his fingers and servants standing round him? What would he do, do you think? He wouldn't know what had happened, the servant replied. He wouldn't know who he was. We'll play a trick on him, that drunken brute. The Lord decided. He told some of his servants what to do. He wanted them to carry Christopher Sly to his own house and to put him to bed. They were to wash the dirt off him and to dress him in fine clothes. Then, when he woke up, they were to make sure that musicians played wonderful music outside the door of the bedroom. If he speaks to you, the Lord told his men, answer him with the greatest respect. Treat him as if he were me. Offer him everything he could want. Make him think he is a lord and that he has been ill for a long time. If he says that he is Christopher Sly, explain that he has been mad for a long time, that he is really a great lord. Tell him that his wife is desperate because of his illness. Make him believe what you say. The servants did what they had been told to do by their master. They picked Christopher Sly up 
and carried him very gently to the Lord's house. He was still asleep and showed no sign of waking. A group of travelling actors now appeared on the road. When they saw the hunting party, they stopped and greeted the Lord politely. The Lord enjoyed all forms of entertainment and he was happy to see the actors. Have you come to perform at my house? He asked them. We would like to perform for you, sir. One of the actors replied. Excellent! The Lord cried. I'm very glad to see you, and you can help me. I'm playing a trick on someone, and you can be a part of it. There's an important Lord staying in my house tonight, he told them. He's a strange man, and he's never seen a play before. When you perform for us, pay no attention if he behaves strangely. Carry on as if you'd noticed nothing odd at all. Will you be able to do that, do you think? Certainly we can, sir. One of the actors replied. We are actors. We know how to control ourselves. Whatever he does, we will show no sign of surprise at his behaviour. I can promise you that. Then you are very welcome to my house. The Lord told them. The servants who were carrying Christopher Sly arrived at the house before the actors and their master. They did everything that their master had instructed. They put the sleeping man into the Lord's own bed. They washed him and dressed him in fine clothes. They put jewellery on his fingers. Then they waited for him to wake up. Christopher Sly groaned in his sleep and turned over. Then he opened one eye and immediately closed it again. He had drunk a lot of beer earlier in the day and he had a headache. After a while, he moved again. Beer! He called. Bring me some beer. I need a drink. One of the Lord's servants stepped forward. Would your Lordship care for some wine? He asked. Another servant stepped forward. Perhaps your Lordship would like something delicate to eat? He inquired. A third servant stepped forward. What will your lordship wear today? He asked. Eh? What's all this? Christopher Sly said. He looked around the room. He did not know where he was. He had never seen such luxury before. Why are you calling me your lordship? And asking me about wine and food and clothes? My name is Christopher Sly. I never drunk wine in my life. I don't eat delicate things, I eat beef. And why are you asking me about what clothes I want to wear? I've only got one set of clothes. At that moment, the Lord entered the bedroom. He thought the joke was going very well, and he was amused at Christopher Sly's confusion. He began to speak. What a pity it is, he said very sadly, to see a great nobleman as mad as this. Christopher Sly looked at him doubtfully. What do you mean? He asked. I'm Christopher Sly, I tell you. Ask the landlady of the tavern at Winkard who I am. She'll tell you all about me and how much I owe her for beer. One of the servants offered Christopher Sly a glass and he began to drink greedily. This is the cause of the problem, the Lord said. You drink too much. This is why your family avoids you and why you went mad. Please think carefully, your lordship. Remember who you are and forget these dreams about Christopher Sly. He doesn't exist. He's just a sign of your illness. Christopher Sly was more confused than ever now. Perhaps it was all true. Perhaps he really was an important and rich lord, as everyone was saying. Remember all the pleasures that wait for you. The lord continued softly. You can have anything you want, he said. If you want music, here it is, the sweetest music in the world. Suddenly, the musicians outside the room began to play. You own a beautiful estate that you can walk around, the lord told him. And wonderful horses, if you want to ride. Your hounds are ready for you, if you want to hunt. 
or if you want to look at beautiful pictures, you have a fine collection of those. You are a lord, I tell you. He repeated. And you have a wife who loves you. She's a beautiful woman, and your illness has made her very unhappy. Now Christopher Sly was convinced. I really am a lord, then he said. And you say I've got a beautiful wife who loves me. He turned to one of the servants. Bring her to me at once, and bring me some beer as well. He commanded. We're so happy to see you're well once more. One of the servants told him. You've been mad for a long time, my lord. Fifteen years it's been since you knew who you were. Fifteen years, Christopher Sly said slowly. But in all that time, didn't I say anything? Didn't I speak at all? You spoke, my lord, the servant said. But you spoke nonsense all the time. You talked about Christopher Sly. You spoke about taverns and arguments about paying for beer. Nothing you said made any sense. It was all a dream, then, Christopher Sly said. I've been dreaming all this time. I don't know what to say. Now a lady in fine clothes entered the room. The lady was really the lord's page. He too was obeying his master's orders. My lord, the page said, "I'm happy to see you." Are you my wife? Christopher Sly asked. Why do you call me Lord, and and not husband? Forgive me, husband," said the page. "You are both my husband, and my lord. What's her name?" Christopher Sly asked one of the servants. "What do I call her?" "You call her Madam," the Lord told him. "That's how lords address their ladies." Christopher Sly looked at the page in the woman's clothes. He thought he was a lucky man to have such a fine wife. Leave us," he ordered the servants. "My wife and I wish to be alone for a while." The servants and the lord left the room. It was difficult for them not to laugh. They were pleased at the success of the joke against Christopher Sly. "Come here, my dear," Sly commanded. "They tell me we have not been together for fifteen years. Come to bed with me." The page had been instructed what to say by the lord. We must be patient," he said. "The doctors want you to be very quiet for a few days. They think that excitement might bring back your madness. We must wait." "Very well," Christopher Sly agreed. "We'll wait for a few days. I don't want to go mad again." A servant now came into the room. "The actors are ready, my lord," the servant announced. "They have heard that you are better, and they want to perform for you." The doctors think a play would be good for you. A play? I don't mind seeing a play. Christopher Sly decided. Come on, madam, let's go and see this performance. You can sit by my side. Listening. Then take him up and manage well the jest. Carry him gently to my fairest chamber. And hang it round with all my wanton pictures, balm his foul head in warm distilled waters, and burn sweet wood to make lodging sweet. Procure me music ready when he wakes to make a dulcet and a heavenly sound. And if he chance to speak, be ready straight and with a low submissive reverence say, "What is it your honour will command?" Part two. Lucencio comes to Padua. Christopher Sly settled himself into a comfortable chair in the chamber where the play was to be performed. He had never seen a play before. Sit next to me, madam. He commanded the page. We'll enjoy the play together. The actors came onto the stage and began their performance. The play was set in Italy. It concerned a young man, Lucencio. Lucencio was the son of a wealthy merchant. His father wanted him to acquire a good education. The young man travelled to Padua to study philosophy at the university there. He arrived in the city with one of his servants, Tranio. His other servant, Biondello, was to arrive later with the luggage. Lucencio and Tranio did not know anyone in Padua, 
and they spent part of the day walking around the city and admiring the sights. At last, they came to a large square in the center of the city. This was the part of the city where rich people lived, and Lucencio looked at the grand houses with pleasure. Suddenly, the door of one of the large houses opened, and a party of people emerged into the square. There were three men and two young girls. The people who came out of the house were all talking excitedly, and they paid no attention to Lucencio and his servant. I wonder what they're so excited about, Lucencio said to Tranio. Let's go behind this tree and listen to what they're saying. Soon they could hear one man's voice raised above the others. This was Baptista, who was the father of the two girls. No more, gentlemen, please, he said. I have made my decision, and I'm not the kind of man who changes his mind. I will not let my younger daughter marry until I found a husband for my older one. Baptista looked at the two men who had come out of the house with himself and his daughters. One of the men was quite old, and the other was young and handsome. You know I like both of you, he went on. And if one of you wants to marry my older girl, Catherine, I'll be happy to agree to the marriage straight away. Now Gremio, the older of the two men, spoke. He had come to Baptista's house because he wanted permission to marry the younger sister, Bianca. Gremio was a rich man, but he was old, and he wanted a quiet life. My friend, he said to Baptista, you know I want to marry Bianca. Catherine is too rude and aggressive for my liking. He paused for a minute. And then turned to the young man with an ironical smile. But perhaps you, Hortensio, would like to marry Catherine. Me? cried Hortensio angrily. You know I love Bianca. The older of the two girls now interrupted the conversation. She was red in the face with anger. You insult me, father! Catherine cried angrily. How dare you offer me to these men! This is no way to choose a husband for your daughter. You needn't be afraid, Hortensio told her. No man will ever marry you until you learn to be polite and friendly. And you're a fool, Catherine replied. When you do marry, your wife will treat you badly for it. You can be sure of that. Tranio was enjoying this scene, and he nudged Lucencio and smiled. What a dreadful girl, he whispered. She's either mad. Or she doesn't care what people think of her at all. But Lucencio was looking at the younger sister, Bianca. He thought she was very beautiful. He sighed deeply. <sighs> so that's my decision, gentlemen. Baptista said to Gremio and Hortensio. No one can marry Bianca until Catherine has a husband. Please come inside now, Bianca. He said gently to his younger daughter. And don't be angry with your father, my dear. You know I love you. Catherine looked angrily at Bianca. Spoilt brat, she sneered. Bianca tried to ignore her sister's unkindness. She spoke to their father. I will do as you ask, father, she said sadly. From now on, I shall devote myself to my books and music. Surely, sir. This is unkind to Bianca, Hortensio argued. I agree, Gremio said. It's not fair to keep one daughter locked in the house for the sake of the other one. Why, you're punishing Bianca for Catherine's rudeness. No more, gentlemen, please, Baptista replied to them. I've made up my mind, I tell you. Bianca will stay in the house until her sister marries. She will study her books and her music. I have decided to employ tutors for her. If either of you gentlemen know of any tutors, I would be grateful. Baptista and his daughters went back into the house. Hortensio and Gremio were left standing outside. They were both unhappy with Baptista's decision regarding Bianca. There it is, my young friend, Gremio said. There's nothing we can do about it. We both love Bianca, and neither of us can see her now. There is only one thing I can do, he went on. I'll send Bianca a good tutor for her studies. Listen to me," said Hortensio eagerly. "We two are rivals for Bianca's love. That makes us enemies, I know. But I think we should forget our enmity for a while. Why don't we work together? 
To achieve what? Gremio asked. We've got to find a husband for Catherine, Hortensio said. Until Catherine marries, we won't be able to see Bianca. What do you say, Gremio? Shall we work together? A husband for Catherine? Gremio said incredulously. Who would want to marry her? I know Baptista's a very rich man, Hortensio, and he's sure to give her a lot of money when she marries. But no man would marry that girl. It's impossible, I tell you. Quite impossible. I don't agree, Hortensio told him. There must be a man somewhere who would marry her. Anyway, if we want to see Bianca again, it's our only hope. We've got to find a husband for the older sister. All right, Gremio replied thoughtfully. I agree that we should work together to find a husband for Catherine. Excellent, cried Hortensio. We'll forget our rivalry for a while. Hortensio and Gremio went off together. Tranio turned to his young master with a smile. He had enjoyed watching the conversations in front of Baptista's house. He thought the situation was an amusing one, and he wanted to discuss the matter with his master. Lucencio did not smile when Tranio looked at him. He was very pale, and he looked ill. What's the matter? Tranio asked. Are you all right, sir? I'm in love, Lucencio replied. I never believed in love at first sight, Tranio, but now I do. I love Bianca, and I must have her. Tell me what to do, Tranio. I need your advice. Tranio was not surprised at the sudden change in Lucencio. He too was a young man, and he understood the importance of love for a young man. He considered carefully for a moment. Perhaps I've got an idea, Tranio said slowly. Did you hear what Baptista said? He asked his master. The only men who can see Bianca now are her tutors. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Lucencio replied. And that gives me an idea, Tranio. But tell me your idea first. Perhaps we've both got the same idea. You must become a tutor, Lucencio. His servant told him. It's the only way to see Bianca. My idea exactly! Cried Lucencio excitedly. I'll become Bianca's tutor. That way, I'll be able to go into her house and talk to her every day. Lucencio was smiling now. He thought this would be an exciting adventure, and it pleased him. Tranio was smiling too. He too thought it would be a great adventure. The two young men began to discuss how they would put their plan into action. No one in Padua knew Lucencio and Tranio because they had just arrived in the city. They decided that Tranio would pretend to be Lucencio, and Lucencio would pretend to be a tutor. They exchanged clothes so that Tranio would look like a rich young man. Tranio was enjoying himself, and he laughed happily at the sight of Lucencio in his servant's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Your father told me to be useful to you while we were in Padua. He joked, though I don't think he meant me to be useful in quite this way. Soon they were joined in the square by Lucencio's second servant, Biondello. He was very surprised to see Tranio dressed in Lucencio's fine clothes and his young master wearing servant's clothing. What's going on? Biondello asked. Why have you swapped clothes? Shh. Hissed Lucencio. You'll ruin everything if you make a noise, Biondello. We've changed clothes because I'm in trouble. I had an argument when we came ashore and I killed a man. No one can recognize me now. From now on, you must treat Tranio as if he were me. Do you understand? Do as Lucencio says. Tranio added. We must do everything to help our master in this situation, and be careful, Biondello. He warned. When there are other people around, remember to call me Lucencio and to behave with the greatest respect to me. There's just one other thing, Lucencio told Tranio. You must pretend that you are in love with Bianca. It's important that you do that. The first part of the play ended here. The Lord and the other people in the chamber applauded the actors loudly. Christopher Sly did not applaud the actors. He had fallen asleep in his comfortable chair. One of the servants approached him and gently woke him. Are you enjoying the play, my lord? The servant asked. Eh? What's that? 
What did you say? Sly muttered sleepily. Ah, the play. Oh yes, yes, very good play. Is it over? Why no, my lord, it's just begun. The servant informed him. Christopher Sly was awake now. It's an excellent play, madam, an excellent play. He told the page. He patted the boy's arm and looked at him tenderly. I can't wait for it to be over. Then we'll be alone together. Listening. Tell me what's really going on, Tranio. You don't think I believe that story of the quarrel, do you? What do you mean? I know you two. You're up to something, and I want to know what it is. You're playing a game of some kind. I'm sure of it. I've got a right to know, Tranio. So come on, tell me the truth. All right, I'll tell you. Lucentia's in love. All this is a plan to get him into the house of the girl he loves. He's going to pretend to be her tutor. That's why we swapped clothes. But why doesn't he call on the father? Explain that he's in love. Lucentio is a rich young man, and he comes from a good family. Surely the father would be happy to let him see the girl. It's more complicated than that, Biondello. I'll explain everything to you. It's like this, you see. We arrived here in Padua, and then. Part five. Petruchio becomes a lover. When Catherine entered the room, Petruchio greeted her enthusiastically. Good morning, Kate. He said with a smile. Catherine frowned at him. My name's not Kate. It's Catherine. She told him coldly. Nonsense. Petruchio replied. You're Kate. You're pretty Kate. My very own Kate. You're famous Kate. He went on. For your politeness, for your beauty, and for all your good qualities. That's why I've come here. I'm going to marry you. Marry me? The girl laughed with scorn. I wish you'd leave me alone. Petruchio laughed. He was not offended by Catherine's rudeness. Suddenly, he moved forward and took her in his arms. Listen, Kate. He cried. I'm a gentleman. A gentleman? Catherine mocked him. Let's see if you're really a gentleman. I know that real gentlemen don't hit girls. And she slapped his face very hard with her hand. Don't do that again, my girl. Petruchio warned her. If you do, I'll hit you back. You see, you're not a gentleman at all. Catherine told him. Now she tried to leave the room, but Petruchio grabbed hold of her again. Again, he was laughing. Not so fast, Kate dear. He cried. I haven't finished with you yet, my dear. Catherine began to struggle in his arms to free herself. She beat Petruchio with her fists and scratched him with her nails, but he did not let her go. You're so gentle, Kate. He mocked her. They told me that you were rough and violent, but I find you gentle and loving. They told me that you were angry and rude, but I find you charming and courteous. Everything they said about you was wrong. Catherine struggled in Petruchio's arms for a while. But he was too strong for her. After a while, she stopped trying to hurt him and stayed still. Now listen to me, Kate. Petruchio told her. Your father has given me permission to marry you, and that's what I'm going to do. You're going to be my wife, Kate. I'm the man who will change you into a good, polite, and gentle woman. Catherine laughed with scorn. <laughs> She had no intention of being changed by any man. She wanted to go on just as she had been doing. Just then, Petruchio heard the sound of footsteps in the corridor outside the room. Shh, Kate. He ordered her. Your father's coming back. Baptista, Gremio, and Tranio came into the room. They were all interested to see how the meeting between Petruchio and Catherine had gone. Well, sir, how do you find my daughter? Baptista asked. He looked anxiously at the two young people. Everything is arranged. Petruchio announced. We get along splendidly. How could it be otherwise? Baptista was very surprised. He looked questioningly at Catherine. She did not seem happy. She did not look like a girl in love. And、uh, you, Catherine? He asked nervously. Are you sure? Now Catherine exploded with anger. What 
kind of a father are you? The girl screamed at him. You want me to marry this madman who thinks he can do exactly what he likes with me? I won't do it, father. I won't do it, I tell you. Petruchio interrupted her. I have learnt the truth about your daughter, Catherine, he told Baptista. Everyone says that she is rude, quarrelsome and aggressive, but they are wrong. She only pretends to be like that. With me, she is gentle, polite and loving. We have agreed to be married on Sunday. Marry you on Sunday? Catherine cried. I'll see you dead before I marry you. Petruchio smiled at Baptista. He did not mind Catherine's anger at all. Pay no attention to what she says now, he advised. Catherine loves me. You can have no idea how gentle she is when we are alone together. And if we are happy, why should you worry, sir? It's just that she does not want to admit that she loves me to other people. We've agreed that she will go on being her old self in front of others, but the marriage will go ahead. That's the important thing. Please organise everything for Sunday. At first, Baptista did not know what to believe. Catherine did not seem happy, but he could not doubt that Petruchio was serious. At last he made up his mind. I'm delighted, he said to both of them. I'll make sure that everything is prepared for Sunday. And now, said Petruchio hurriedly, I must go to Venice. I have some business there to attend to. I will return on Sunday for the wedding. He took Catherine in his arms. Kiss me, Kate, he said. We'll be married on Sunday. Petruchio then left the house. Well, said Gremio when Petruchio had left the house. That was quick work, all right. I've never seen a wedding agreed so rapidly before. Then he remembered his own business with Baptista. But now, sir, he said, we can talk about your other daughter, Bianca. You know that I love her and that I want to marry her. I love her too, and I want to marry her. Tranio interrupted the older man. Gremio laughed at Tranio. <laughs> you? He said. You don't know what love is, young man. And you're too old to know what love is. Tranio replied angrily. No girl could love an old man like you, Gremio. Baptista now spoke. I know you both love Bianca, he told them. And I will give her to the man who is most generous to her. You, Gremio, he asked. How much money will you give her? You know me, sir, Gremio answered. You know that I have a fine house here in Padua. I also have a large farm in the countryside. I am an old man, Baptista, and when I die, all these things will be Bianca's. Tranio laughed at Gremio's offer. <laughs> My father is a rich man, he told Baptista. And I am his only son. If I marry Bianca, I will give her three or four houses that are as good as Gremio's, as well as an income of two thousand ducats from land. He paused for a moment and looked ironically at Gremio. I think that beats your offer, sir, he inquired. Gremio was astonished at the generosity of Tranio's offer. His land did not produce two thousand ducats a year. But Gremio was an experienced businessman, and he did not express his surprise at the magnificence of Tranio's offer. I also have a fleet of ships, he told Baptista. If Bianca marries me, I will give her the ships as well. Now it was his turn to mock Tranio. Does my fleet of ships defeat you, young man? he asked coolly. Tranio laughed at the older man. <laughs> Ah, my father has three fleets of ships, he responded, as well as other vessels. If Bianca marries me, they will all be hers. Now Gremio was in despair. He could not match Tranio's offer. I cannot offer more, he said sadly. I have no more to offer her. Then Bianca is mine, Tranio cried excitedly. You have certainly offered more, it's true, Baptista agreed. But what if you die before your father? What would happen to your offer then? You must ask your father to guarantee the offer you have made. Then my daughter will be yours. That's only right, you know. Ask my father to guarantee my offer, Tranio said in surprise. I'm young and my father is old. I'm not going to die before he does. 
Young men do sometimes die before their fathers, Gremio said. I must have your father's promise, Baptista said firmly. Catherine will be married next Sunday. You can marry Bianca the Sunday after that if you bring me your father's guarantee before then. That is my final decision. Gremio began to laugh cruelly at Tranio. <laughs> Young fool! He mocked. You'll never get your father's guarantee. He'll never promise to give Bianca all his fortune while he lives. I shall win her in the end. Now Tranio was in despair. He had tried to win Bianca for Lucencio, but he realized that he had made promises that his master could not keep. Then he had a sudden idea. It's true that Lucencio's father will never agree to give this guarantee. He thought. But if we can find someone to pretend to be Lucencio's father, it will do just as well. That's what we'll do. We'll fool Baptista with an imposter. Listening. I am a gentleman of Verona, sir. That hearing of her beauty and her wit, her affability and bashful modesty, her wondrous qualities and mild behaviour, am bold to show myself a forward guest within your house, to make mine eye the witness of that report which I so oft have heard. Part six, rivalry and marriage. Over the next few days. Hortensio and Lucencio began their work as tutors to Bianca. Both young men were in love with their pupil, and they were very jealous of each other. Each tried to interrupt the lessons of the other in order to be alone with Bianca. It's not the time for your music lesson, Lucio. Lucencio said to Hortensio, "Leave us alone now to study, will you?" He laughed at his rival. <laughs> Remember how Catherine treated her music tutor. He mocked him. Hortensio began to be annoyed with Lucencio. Don't you know that music is more important than books, Cambio? He asked scornfully. Leave us in peace to make music together. You don't even know why music was invented, Lucencio told him. Music is intended to relax us after we have worked or studied. So let us do some work, Lucio. Then you can play your music. Bianca watched the argument between her two tutors. She still did not know who Licio and Cambio really were. She did not like them to quarrel about her. Gentlemen, she cried, "Please don't argue like this. You are both forgetting something. I'm not a child who has to have one hour of music followed by one hour of reading. I will decide what I study and when I study." You can tune your lute, Licio," she suggested. While Cambio reads to me, when the instrument is ready, we'll have some music. Hortensio began to adjust the lute. Lucencio and Bianca opened one of the books. He sat very close to the girl and read to her. They were studying Latin, and Lucencio was pretending to translate for her. Hic ibat. He read aloud. Then he whispered, "I'm not really a tutor at all." My name is Lucencio. The Lucencio who comes to the house is my servant Tranio. I love you. Bianca was very surprised at Lucencio's words. She wanted to learn more, but just then Hortensio made a loud noise with a lute. "I'm ready," he cried. "I've tuned the instrument. We can begin our lesson now, Bianca." Bianca looked at him impatiently. She wanted to continue the conversation with Lucencio. She did not want to be disturbed. The lute isn't quite tuned, Licio," she told him. "It doesn't sound right. Please tune it again." Hortensia was annoyed, but he went back to the instrument and began to tune it again. Bianca smiled at Lucencio, and they pretended to go on with their Latin lesson. "Let me see if I understand properly," Bianca said. She opened the book and pointed at the page they had been studying. Hic ibat, she began in a loud voice. In a very low voice, she said, "I don't know you. Speak quietly so that he can't hear us. You haven't won me yet, but don't give up hope." Hortensio stepped forward once more. 
He saw that Bianca and Lucencia were sitting very close together, and he was suddenly suspicious. Perhaps the tutor was trying to make Bianca fall in love with him. Hortensio decided to listen to their conversation. I may believe it one day, Hortensio heard Bianca say, but just now I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. Lucencio could see Hortensio's shadow on the floor. He raised a finger in warning to Bianca and pointed at the shadow. Then he spoke to her as if they were discussing her lesson. You can be sure of it. Ajax was named after his grandfather. Bianca was delighted at Lucencio's cleverness and she replied, I must believe what my tutor tells me. She then turned round and looked at Hortensio. Shall we have some music now? she asked him politely. You'd better leave us, Hortensio told Lucencio. We're going to play a duet together. Now Lucencio was suspicious of Hortensio. He thought that Hortensio would try to make Bianca fall in love with him. We must practice scales, Hortensio told Bianca. Please look at this, he said to her and handed her a piece of paper. It's a musical exercise that I've devised for you. Read it carefully. Bianca looked at the piece of paper and began reading. A. Amore. B. Be mine. C. See my love for you. D. Delight me. E. Enchanting. This exercise teaches you that Hortensio loves you. Be kind to him and love him. Bianca folded the piece of paper and gave it back to the young man. I don't like these new exercises, she told him with a sweet smile. I prefer the old ones. The week passed quickly and it was soon Sunday morning, the day of Catherine's wedding. Everyone met in the square outside Baptista's house in their finest clothes. They were waiting for the bridegroom, but there was no sign of him. They had been waiting a long time and everybody was nervous. Some of them began to think that Petruchio would not come. Petruchio's late, Baptista complained to Tranio. I wonder where he is. Think what a disgrace it will be if he doesn't come. The disgrace will be mine, Catherine said. This was a very important day for her and she was nervous. I told you he was mad, father, she complained. He'll never come. The whole thing was just a joke. He meant to make a fool of me. Think how everyone will laugh at me because of this. Everyone will point at me in the street. They'll say, that's Petruchio's wife, if he could only be bothered to come and marry her. She began to cry. Tranio did his best to comfort Catherine and to reassure her father. I'm sure he's coming, he told them. Petruchio may be a little wild, but he means well. Something has delayed him, that's all. Oh, I wish I'd never seen him, Catherine sobbed. She had never been so humiliated. She turned round and began walking to the house. She wanted to hide away from all the people who had come to see her married. Baptista watched her walk away. He felt very sorry for her. You're right. Go home, he told her. There's no point in staying here now. He'll never come now. Suddenly, there was an excited shout from the far end of the square. A man came running towards the wedding group. It was Biondello. Master, he cried loudly. I've got news, Master. The strangest news, too. Petruchio is coming, Biondello announced. I've just seen him, but he's wearing the oddest clothes. He's wearing a new hat, but everything else is old. His jacket is old and dirty, his sword is old and rusty, and his boots are old and broken. Even his horse is old and tired. He's not dressed for a wedding at all. Baptista was very relieved to hear that Petruchio was coming. At least he's here, he said impatiently to Biondello. The wedding will go ahead. He looked down the square. There he is, he cried. Petruchio and his servant Grumio came into sight. They were both wearing old, dirty clothes, and Petruchio's horse was old and ugly. Petruchio was smiling happily, 
as if there was nothing strange about the way he was dressed or the horse he was riding. Good morning to you all, he called out loudly. Baptista looked at Petruchio and nodded coldly. Welcome, sir, he muttered. He was offended by Petruchio's behaviour. You're not as well dressed as we imagined you might be, Tranio told him. Well dressed? Petruchio replied carelessly. What does that matter? I don't care about being well dressed. He looked around. But where's Kate? He asked. Where's my lovely bride? No one answered him. Everyone was surprised and shocked at his behaviour. Why are you all looking at me so strangely? Petruchio demanded. What's the matter? What have I done? First we thought you weren't coming, Baptista explained angrily. Catherine was very upset, and she's gone back inside the house. Then you arrived dressed like this, he said bitterly. On your wedding day. My clothes are not important, Petruchio said again. It's me your daughter is marrying, not my clothes. Now I want to see Kate. I want to see my bride. Petruchio walked into the house, followed by Baptista and the other wedding guests. Only Tranio and Lucencio waited in the square. They wanted to speak together for a moment. Lucencio told his servant how the lessons with Bianca were going. He believed that she was falling in love with him. Good, said Tranio. That's excellent. Now we must make her father accept you as well. We need someone to pretend to be your father, sir. Someone who will give Baptista the property guarantees that he has asked for. Petruchio's behaviour during the wedding service made everyone ashamed. He acted like a madman. He had not changed his old clothes, and he seemed determined to do everything he could to embarrass and humiliate his bride. The priest asked him if he would take Catherine as his wife. You're damn right I will, Petruchio roared loudly. The priest was so surprised that he dropped his prayer book. As he bent down to pick it up, Petruchio knocked him over. As the service came to an end, Petruchio seized hold of Catherine and kissed her passionately. Then he shouted for wine. Petruchio's extraordinary behaviour continued after the church service. Everyone went back to Baptista's house. Catherine's father had prepared a huge and costly wedding feast for all the guests. Friends, Petruchio announced. I know you all expected to dine with us today. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry to go, so I cannot eat with you. There was a shocked silence from the guests. Baptista was already very angry with Petruchio, and now he could hardly believe what the young man was saying. Go? He demanded. What do you mean, go? Surely you'll eat with us to celebrate the wedding? I'm sorry, Petruchio replied. I have urgent business, and I must go. But I hope you will all stay and enjoy yourselves," he said to the guests. "Please change your mind," Tranio said. "Please eat with us all." "I can't," replied Petruchio. "Do change your mind," Gremio said. "I can't," Petruchio replied once more. "Stay, please," Catherine said. "For my sake, stay." Petruchio smiled at her. "Ah, that makes me happy," he said softly. You mean you're happy to stay? Catherine asked him. I'm happy that you asked me. He told her. But I will not stay. Catherine was almost in tears again. If you love me, stay. She begged. Petruchio turned to his servant, Grumio. Get my horse ready. He commanded. I'm leaving immediately. Catherine was suddenly furious. Petruchio had deliberately ruined her wedding day, and she could no longer control her emotions. Go then! She screamed. There's the door, sir. Go if you want, but I won't go with you. I'm staying here. She spoke to the guests. Please go in and eat. She invited them. Yes, go in, go in and eat. Petruchio told them. Then he leapt forward and grabbed Catherine. But my wife is coming with me. Catherine struggled fiercely in his arms, but Petruchio was strong. She's my wife. He shouted. And my wife will do as I tell her. Now he drew his sword and waved it in the air. He waved it menacingly at the guests. Don't try to stop us! He cried loudly. Don't worry, Kate. And he carried her out of the house. Everyone was astonished at what had happened. They're mad, Baptista commented sadly. They're both mad. Then he remembered his guests.
The bride and groom have gone, he said, but we will still have our feast. Lucentio, will you take Petruchio's place at the table? And you, Bianca, will you sit in your sister's place? Listening. We're studying the taming of the shrew at school. Do you like it? Well, it's about marriage. It's set in Italy, and the plot is a bit ridiculous. People put on disguises and trick each other. And there's this character, Petruchio. I suppose he's quite clever and everything, but basically the play seems like an attack on women to me. I remember now. That's the play where he treats the girl badly to teach her good manners. I've seen the film. I think it's brilliant. It's really funny. I like the part where he arrives for the wedding in horrible old clothes. Yes, but you see, it just seems to me that the play puts women down a lot. I mean, it's all right for Petruchio to marry for money. No one criticizes him for that. But Catherine is a woman, so she has to be punished for being outspoken and aggressive. I see what you mean. Maybe you've got a point. But aren't you being a bit serious about it? It is a comedy, after all. Perhaps you're right. Maybe I Part am. Seven. Love lessons. Petruchio and Catherine had a long and uncomfortable journey to Petruchio's house in the country. The weather was very cold and wet, and Catherine fell from her horse into the mud. They ate nothing while they were on the road, and when they arrived at the house, they were both tired, hungry, and dirty. Never mind, my love, Petruchio said affectionately. Once we're inside, we'll wash and get warm, then we'll eat something. As soon as they arrived at the house, Petruchio began shouting orders at his servants. Food! He cried. Bring us food and some water to wash in. Hurry, you fools! A servant rushed into the room carrying a bowl of hot water. Petruchio pretended not to see the man. He looked in the other direction. Then he fell against the man deliberately, and the water was spilt on the floor. Idiot! He shouted. Why don't you look where you're going? He struck the servant as if he were angry. Please don't hit him, Catherine said quietly. It was an accident. It wasn't the servant's fault. Petruchio smiled to himself. Catherine was beginning to show a new gentleness that pleased him. Come, my dear, he said tenderly. Let's eat, shall we? I know you're hungry. He led her to the table, and they sat down. Another servant entered the room and placed a huge dish of meat in front of them. Catherine stared at the food. She hadn't eaten for a long time, and she was starving. What kind of meat is this? Petruchio asked the servant. Is it mutton? Yes, sir. The man replied. Petruchio bent over the dish of meat and sniffed it. Then he frowned. Burnt! He cried. You've burnt the meat, you fool! Take it away. He knocked the whole dish to the floor. Then he rose to his feet and chased the servant out of the room. Catherine tried to calm her husband. Really, it was all right. She told him quietly. I don't think it was burnt at all. We could have eaten it. She said quietly. It was burnt. Petruchio repeated. I can't eat burnt meat. It's not good for my health. But don't worry, Kate. He said with a smile. Tomorrow we'll eat something good. Now, let's go to bed, shall we? Petruchio took Catherine to her bedroom. He was pleased with the way things were going. He had spilt the water on purpose so that Catherine could not wash. He had thrown the meat on the floor to prevent her from eating, and now he was determined that he would stop her from sleeping. She didn't sleep last night. He reminded himself. And she hasn't eaten today. I'll make sure she doesn't sleep tonight, and I'll throw away the food tomorrow as well. I'll pretend that I'm doing everything for her benefit. She'll suffer, poor girl, but it's the only way to conquer her bad temper. She'll learn soon enough. He chuckled to himself. He believed he could teach his wife how to behave properly. The lessons in Baptista's house were continuing, and Lucencio and Bianca saw a lot of each other. Bianca was in love with Lucencio, and the young couple spent most of the day together. 
They pretended to be studying, and Bianca was careful to call her lover Cambio when other people were near them. Hortensio had noticed the intimacy between Bianca and her tutor, and he was angry and offended by her behaviour. He went to Tranio to tell him what he suspected. So you think Bianca loves you, Lucentio? Hortensio asked him. Come with me, and I'll show you who she really loves. Tranio and Hortensio watched the next lesson. They heard the conversation between Bianca and her tutor. What are you reading? Bianca asked him softly. It's a book about the art of love. He replied, smiling. <laughs> I hope you master that art. Bianca told him with a little laugh. You see, Hortensio whispered to Tranio. She's in love with that Cambio fellow. Tranio pretended to be shocked and angry at Bianca's behaviour. I'm not really a tutor, Hortensio now confided to Tranio. And my name's not Licio. I'm a gentleman, and my name's Hortensio. I came here in disguise to win Bianca's love. But look at her. He went on. In love with a tutor, and she's kissing him. What a disgrace she is! Tranio found it difficult not to laugh, but he controlled himself with an effort. I'm glad you showed me what she's really like. He said, "I can't be interested in a girl like that. I give her up." He announced gravely. Just look at them," Hortensio said again. "It's disgraceful the way they're behaving. I too," he said very seriously. "We'll give her up. I don't want anything more to do with her. Now that I know what she's like, I promise you one thing," Tranio now said. "I'll never marry her. Never. Nor will I," Hortensio told him. "I know a rich widow here in Padua. She loves me, and she'll marry me if I ask her. Kindness is more important than beauty, after all." Hortensio walked away from Baptista's house. Tranio went to join Lucentio and Bianca. He told them about his conversation with Hortensio. "I've given you up, you know," he joked to Bianca. "And so has Hortensio. He's gone off to marry a rich widow." "Ha! <laughs> so there'll be no more music lessons." Lucentio laughed. "He'll tame the widow," Tranio commented. "He's gone to the taming school." "Taming school?" Bianca asked. Is there such a place, Tranio? Tranio laughed. <laughs> Indeed, there is. He told her. And Petruchio is the taming master. The three young people were laughing happily together when Biondello ran up to them. I found one. He cried. I found the perfect man to be your father, Lucentio. He's a serious-looking man, a merchant of some kind. He'll do perfectly. Take me to him, Tranio said. I'll persuade him to be Vincenzo for us. We need him to give those property guarantees to Baptista. Biondello showed Tranio where the old man was. Good morning, sir. Tranio said politely. Good morning to you. The man replied. Have you just arrived in Padua? Tranio asked courteously. I have. The man replied. I'm from Mantua. This reply gave Tranio a sudden idea. He pretended to look surprised. Mantua. He gasped. You've come from Mantua, sir. Then you're in danger, sir. There's a quarrel between the two cities. If they find anyone from Mantua here in Padua, they kill him. The old man looked desperate. Oh no! He groaned. What can I do? I've got business here in the city. I'll help you, sir. Tranio offered. My name is Lucentio, and I'm the son of Vincenzo of Pisa. Do you know him by any chance? I know who Vincenzo is. The man said. He's one of the richest men in Pisa. Well," said Tranio. "Why don't you stay here with me and pretend to be Vincenzo? You'll be safe while you're in Padua." The man was very grateful to Tranio. "I can't thank you enough," he said. "You've saved my life."、Uh, "One other thing," Tranio told him. "My father is expected here in Padua. He has to give some property guarantees that concern my marriage to Baptista's daughter. I'll tell you exactly what you have to do. It's very simple." Now come with me to my house, and we'll dress you like my father. Part Eight: Conflict and Disguise. The days passed slowly for Catherine in Petruchio's house. She never ate a decent meal or slept properly at night. She was hungry and tired the whole time, and she was very miserable. Petruchio always spoke kindly to her, 
and continued the pretense that everything he did was for her happiness. One day, Hortensio came to visit Petruchio and Catherine. Petruchio was happy to see his old friend, and he smiled happily at Catherine. Cheer up, my love, he told her. Look, I've brought you some food. He put a dish of meat on the table in front of her. Catherine looked hungrily at it and immediately began to eat. Surely you should thank me, my love, Petruchio asked her. Catherine, who was very hungry, did not say a word. She was too busy eating. It was the first food she had eaten for days. Not a word of thanks to your husband, Petruchio said. I see you do not like this food, Kate. He snatched the dish away. Please put it back, Catherine asked him humbly. Every kindness deserves thanks, Kate, Petruchio told her. Thank you, Catherine said quietly. Petruchio replaced the dish on the table. Catherine began eating hurriedly again. I've had an idea, my love, Petruchio now said to her. Let's go to Padua, to your father's house. We'll have some smart new clothes for the journey. Catherine looked up in surprise. She had not expected Petruchio to suggest that they go to her father's house. She wanted to go. At least she would be able to eat something there. Petruchio smiled at her and made a quick sign to Grumio. The servant removed the dish of meat from the table. Ah, said Petruchio. I see you finished eating. Let's go and speak to the tailor about our new clothes, shall we? Petruchio, Hortensio, and Catherine went into another room of the house where the tailor was waiting for them. The tailor showed them the clothes he had made for Catherine. They were beautifully made, but Petruchio pretended that he did not like them. He picked up a beautiful hat and threw it on the floor. Take this frightful thing away! He shouted. My wife can't wear something like that. But I like it, Petruchio. Catherine told him. It's a lovely hat. You can have it when you know how to behave. Petruchio muttered quietly. Suddenly, Catherine lost her temper. She was still hungry, and she was exhausted after so many nights without sleep. Her old temper came back to her. Enough! She screamed at Petruchio. I'm not a child. I am a grown woman, and I won't be treated like this. I won't stand it. Do you hear me? I won't stand it. Petruchio knew why Catherine was angry, but he pretended that she was angry about the hat. You're quite right, he said tenderly. It's a dreadful hat. Take it away, he commanded the tailor. But I like the hat, Catherine shouted at him. I like the hat, and I want it. Now Petruchio pretended that Catherine wanted to look at the dresses the tailor had made. Once again, he criticized everything that the man showed them. None of these things is good enough for my wife. He roared. Take them all away, and take yourself away too. He shouted at the tailor. The tailor was frightened, and he ran out of the room. Never mind, Kate. Petruchio said gently. We'll go to your father's house in our old clothes. After all, what do clothes matter? They're not important at all. Now he went on thoughtfully. It's seven o'clock. If I tell the men to have the horses ready for us at the end of Long Lane, we can easily walk there by dinner time. But it's not seven o'clock, Petruchio. Catherine interrupted him. It's nearly two o'clock now, and it will be very late before we get to Long Lane. Petruchio's face clouded. He looked sternly at his wife. You are still opposing me, Kate," he said slowly. "If I say it's seven o'clock, why do you disagree with me?" He paused for a moment. "I've changed my mind," he announced. "We won't go to Padua today, after all. And when I do decide to go," he said threateningly to Catherine. "It will be the time I say it is." He walked out of the room, slamming the door as he went. He was determined to teach Catherine that she had to obey him. Lucencio and Tranio were still planning to play their trick on Baptista. Tranio and the merchant walked to Baptista's house together. Remember what I told you, Tranio reminded him. You're my father, Vincencio. You've just arrived in Padua. You've heard about my love for Bianca, and you approve of the marriage. Remember to say that you're ready to sign the guarantees that Baptista wants. Don't worry," the merchant told him. 
I'll do exactly what you want. I've understood everything perfectly. It will all go splendidly, you'll see. Baptista was leaving his house when they arrived. He greeted Tranio and the merchant politely. The merchant played his part well. Baptista believed that he was Vincencio, and the two men talked about the marriage of Bianca. I'll be happy for Bianca to marry your son, sir, Baptista told the man. Let's meet this evening to discuss the property guarantees. But let's not meet at my house, gentlemen. I don't want my servants to hear what we discuss. Then we'll meet at our house, Tranio suggested. Good, Baptista agreed. He called Lucencio. Go to my daughter, Cambio, he instructed. Tell her to come to Lucencio's house. Tell her Vincentio is here. <laughs> and she'll soon be married to Lucentio, he added with a happy laugh. Tranio, Baptista, and the merchant walked away together. They were talking happily. Biondello now appeared. He was looking for Lucentio. Everything is arranged, he whispered urgently. Baptista is out of the way. Tranio and the merchant will keep him talking for hours. Don't you worry. The priest who works in St. Luke's church is waiting for you. What do you mean the priest is waiting for me? Lucentio asked. You can marry Bianca, Biondello said. Take her to the church, Lucentio. I'll wait for you both there. Biondello ran off. I'll do it, Lucentio thought to himself. We'll go to St. Luke's. We'll be married. Part nine. The bet. Petruchio, Catherine, and Hortensio set out together for Padua. Petruchio was still determined to make Catherine obey him. He wanted her to agree with whatever he said, even when he was wrong. It was a bright, sunny day, and this gave him an idea. Look at the moon! He exclaimed. How beautiful it is, Catherine! The moon! Catherine replied with surprise. That's not the moon, Petruchio. It's the sun. I say it is the moon. Petruchio told her firmly. And I say it is the sun. Catherine answered defiantly. Hortensio now gave Catherine some quiet advice. Just agree that it's the moon, Catherine. He whispered to her. Otherwise, he'll make us all go back to his house. We'll never get to Padua. Very well, Petruchio. Catherine said. If you say it is the moon. I also say it is the moon. I agree with what you say it is. Petruchio was happy with Catherine's response, and they continued their journey. Soon the travellers met an old man who was also going to Padua. Petruchio decided to test Catherine's obedience again. You see that girl? He asked her. Look how lovely she is, Catherine. Go up to her and embrace her, my love. Catherine understood her husband now, and she went up to the old man. She spoke to him as if he were a girl, and embraced him tenderly. Immediately, Petruchio called out to her, "What are you doing? That's not a girl, Catherine. It's an old man." "Forgive me, sir," Catherine said to the old man. "I was mistaken for a moment." They began talking to the old man, and he explained that he was Vincencio. He told them he was travelling to Padua to see his son Lucencio. Petruchio was delighted to meet Lucencio's father. He told the old man about the love between Lucencio and Bianca. Vincencio was astonished at the news, and at first he did not believe it. They all agreed to travel to Padua together. When they arrived in the city, they went to Lucencio's house. Vincencio was very keen to see his son. They knocked loudly on the door of the house. A window opened, and the merchant looked out at them. Is Lucencio in? Vincencio called up to him. He is, but he's busy. The merchant replied. You can't see him now. Tell Lucencio that his father's here. Petruchio now called out. You're lying. The merchant replied. I am his father. Petruchio was now angry with Vincencio. You tried to trick me, sir. He said angrily. Why did you pretend to be Lucencio's father? Arrest him! The merchant called loudly. Arrest that man who is pretending to be Lucencio's father. 
Vincencio was now very angry and confused. Then he saw Biondello walking along the street. He thought that Biondello would identify him. You, sir! He called out. Come here! Biondello recognized Vincencio immediately, but he pretended not to know him. He did not want to ruin Lucencio's careful plans. Do you know who I am? Vincencio now asked him. Biondello looked at him for a moment. I've never seen you before in my life, he replied calmly. Vincencio suddenly lost his temper and began beating Biondello. I'll teach you to remember who I am, he shouted angrily. Baptista, Tranio and the merchant came out of the house to see what the noise was about. Tranio also pretended not to know who Vincencio was. Tranio! Vincencio shouted. What are you doing in those fine clothes? And where's my son? I don't know what you're talking about, Tranio said. I don't know who you are. I think you must be mad. Arrest him! The merchant called out once again. Arrest this man! Yes, arrest him, Baptista agreed. I don't know who he is, but he's come here to play a trick of some kind. I'm sure of that. Now Lucencio and Bianca appeared. They had come from the church where they had just been married. When Lucencio saw his father, he realized that he would now have to tell the truth about what had been going on. He approached his father and knelt on the ground in front of him. Forgive me, father. He said very quietly. Tranio, Biondello, and the merchant looked at each other. They knew the truth would come out now. Vincencio and Baptista would be angry with them for the tricks they had been playing. Suddenly they were frightened. They ran away down the street as fast as they could. Bianca now approached her father. She, too, knelt on the ground in front of him. Forgive me, father, she said very quietly. Forgive you? Baptista repeated in great surprise. What for, my dear? What have you done? He did not know what was happening. Then he had a thought. He looked around with a puzzled expression. But where's Lucentio? He asked his daughter. He was here a moment ago. Where's he gone? Lucentio heard Baptista's question, and he stepped forward. I am Lucentio, sir, he told him. The man you thought was Lucencio is really Tranio, my servant. He was following my orders in everything he did. Nothing is his fault. You see, he said, I was only pretending to be Cambio so that I could see Bianca. I'm in love with her, he went on. And we've just come from St. Luke's Church, sir. We are married. Baptista and Vincencio were confused by the plot Lucencio now revealed to them. They were angry with the young people for having deceived them. Vincencio went into his son's house and Baptista went into his. Don't worry, Lucencio told his new wife. They'll soon talk to each other and then they'll accept what we've done. Everything will be all right. Don't worry. Lucencio was right. The two fathers were angry for a while, but then they talked together. Their anger passed and they congratulated the young couple on their marriage. Soon there was a great banquet at Lucencio's house in honor of the married couples. Everyone was invited, including Hortensio and his new wife. He had kept to his determination to marry the rich widow. The recently married couples teased each other good naturedly over the table. Hortensio's wife and Catherine nearly had a quarrel. The woman said that everyone knew Catherine was rude and aggressive and would never obey her husband. This upset Catherine. And she was still thinking about it when the women rose from the table and went into another room. Baptista now spoke to Petruchio. Whatever you say, he told him. I think the widow was right. Catherine is a difficult woman. I don't agree, sir, Petruchio replied. But why don't we have a bet on it? He suggested eagerly. Let's send for our wives and see who comes first. What do you say? He asked Hortensio and Lucencio. I bet twenty crowns that Bianca comes first, Lucencio replied. Twenty crowns? Petruchio laughed scornfully. I would bet much more than that on my wife's obedience. Very well, Lucencio agreed. One hundred crowns. I bet one hundred crowns that Bianca comes.
Me too, Hortensio now said. I bet 100 crowns that my wife comes when I ask her to. Lucencio now told Biondello to go to the room where the women were. Ask Bianca to come to me, he told the servant. Biondello returned after a few minutes. Well, Lucencio wanted to know. Where's Bianca? She said she was busy, sir, Biondello told him. She said she couldn't come. It was now Hortensio's turn. Go to my wife, Biondello, he ordered the servant. Beg her to come here to me. Once again, Biondello left the room, and once again he returned alone. Hortensia was annoyed. What happened? He asked. What did she say? She said she knew there was a joke going on. Biondello told him. She refused to come. Petruchio laughed. Then he turned to his servant, Grumio. Go to Catherine, he said, and tell her that I order her to come. Once again, the men waited. She'll never come, Hortensio announced. Catherine would never obey a direct order. We'll see, Petruchio said patiently. Suddenly, Catherine entered the room. What can I do for you? she asked Petruchio humbly. Petruchio looked at Hortensio and Lucencio triumphantly. He had won the bet. Go to the other wives, he told Catherine, and make them come here. Their husbands have sent for them. Catherine left the room. In a few minutes, she returned with Bianca and the widow. Bianca and the widow did not look very happy. What silly, silly joke, joke is, is this? this? They wanted to know. It's not a joke, Petruchio told them. Then he spoke to his wife. Catherine, he said tenderly, explain to these women what marriage really is. A rude and quarrelsome wife is an ugly thing, Catherine told them. Our husbands need our love and tenderness, not our anger and our rudeness. I am as clever as you, she said to Bianca and the widow. And perhaps I have had better reason than you to be angry with my husband. But now I see that a woman's anger is a false thing. Our husbands are our lords, and we must obey them. It is the natural order of life. And I, she concluded, am ready to do whatever my husband asks me. Well spoken, Petruchio said. Kiss me, Kate. He looked at Hortensio and Lucencio with pride. I have won the bet, sirs, he said. Kate is an obedient wife at last.